Thank you very much, and I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me, and Allison in particular for editing my slides. I tend to put together two-hour talks and then try to give them in 20 minutes, so I'll see how I do on this one. Uh, I do have one disclosure. I'm on the advisory panel of QMED RX, but I have no financial ties to the company. Um, so I'd, li I'd like to start by giving you an overview of Lyme disease. Uh, and this comes from none other than one of the great thinkers of the 21st century, who was the former Secretary of Defense of the United States, Donald Rumsfeld, who famously said, we know that there are known unknowns, that is to say, we know that there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns, the ones that we don't know, we don't know. And I think that says an awful lot about Lyme disease. And more particularly, this is a statement from the late Ed Masters, who said, First off, they said it was a new disease, which it wasn't. Then it was thought to be viral, but it isn't. Then it was only transmitted by the Ixodes damini tick, which is no longer considered a valid tick species. Then it was thought that seronegativity didn't exist, which it does. Then they thought it was easily treated by short courses of antibiotics, which sometimes it isn't. If you look throughout the history of Lyme disease, almost every time a major dogmatic statement has been made about what we know about this disease, it was subsequently proven wrong or underwent major modification. So I'm going to talk about one of those dogmatic statements, which is about the transmission of Lyme disease. Once you get bitten by a tick, this is a tick hiding in the belly button of one of my patients. Uh, this is a more interesting view of the same event uh, taken from uh, uh, an EM study uh, looking at the tick sticking a typo steel in through the skin and potentially infecting someone. Um, so the question is, how long does it take for a tick to transmit Lyme disease? And if you look uh, at the uh, first place that everybody goes for information these days, which is the internet, uh, the first thing you'll find is the CDC website, uh, which says that in most cases, the tick must be attached for 36 to 48 hours or more before the Lyme disease bacterium can be transmitted. And if you're not satisfied with that, you can always go to the website of the uh, um, Infectious Diseases Society of America, which says, which says a tick has to be attached to the skin for at least two days to transmit the Lyme bacteria. And in fact, Ray Datweiler, who is a, a co-author of the IDSA Lyme Guidelines, gave a talk last week in New York where he repeated uh, this uh, statement that at least two days before a tick can transmit Lyme disease. So. What is this uh, statement based on? Well, there are a number of animal studies that seem to support uh, this statement. Uh, this is a study from uh, Hogard and uh, Joe Biesman's group uh, looking at transmission of Borrelia to mice. And uh, what they found was within 24 hours, sure enough, uh, there was zero transmission uh, in this animal model of Borrelia burgdorferi uh, from nymphs that were attached to mice. By 48 hours, you actually did get a little bit of transmission, 4.9%, and then it went from there. But within 24 hours, zero transmission. Uh, and this is just to show you this more graphically. Again, within 24 hours, uh, no transmission, but then slowly within 48 hours, you start to see transmission, and then from there. Um, another study done by uh, Chindi Peavy and Bob Lane at uh, UC Berkeley, uh, seemed to confirm this. This was, a, again, a study of uh, transmission in mice uh, with um, uh, Ixodes uh, pacificus nymphs. And again, here, if you look at the duration of attachment of 24 hours, zero transmission, only eight mice, not, very, not a big number, but there was no transmission at 24 hours. By 48 hours, you started to see some transmission. 11% of the animals got infected. But again, it looks like after 24 hours, no transmission. And in fact, uh, this is the basis of an article in the New England Journal of Medicine saying that indeed when the tick is attached for less than 36 hours, so they kind of split the difference, it is not necessary to treat the tick bite because theoretically there's no transmission. Now what's the problem with these animal models? Well, first of all, they are animal models that involve rodents such as mice, hamsters, or gerbils, and or rabbits, which have been used sometimes for this. Um, they use laboratory strains of Borrelia burgdorferi, such as the B31 strain, the JD1, and the CA4 strains, which are in fact not found in the wild. So these are truly laboratory experiments with strains that you would not find infecting people. Uh, there were no studies of tick co-infections, 
that can influence transmission, and I'll get back to that at the end of the talk. Uh, tick transmission factors such as tick saliva and mucosal contact wasn't considered. Uh, host immunity in the human versus the animal model wasn't examined. And one of the biggest problems is that these studies all had uniform tick removal techniques. And Chindi Peavy told me she was so good at flicking ticks off her mice, she could do it in literally 10 seconds, and the mouse wouldn't even know what hit it. So that's very different from what usually happens in, in humans when you know, there are all different techniques of removing ticks that differ, that differ from that. So the next question is, how, long, how do we know how long a tick has been attached? Obviously, in these controlled studies, they can control for that, but what about in humans? Well, um, uh, this is a, uh, an article, an old article from The Lancet that allegedly shows how you can tell the difference in ticks by how long they've attached. In fact, if you look at these three ticks, I don't think very many people could tell much of a difference from looking at that. So visually, it's not that easy. Maybe the fourth one here, which is after four days, is really big. But uh, that's, that's pretty obvious. Um, so in order to understand how long a tick has been attached, you have to understand a little bit about tick anatomy, and I'll do this very quickly. Uh, this is a dorsal view and a ventral view of the tick. The tick on the dorsum has this hard plate called the scutum that doesn't expand. And then it has the body called the idiosoma. And then on the ventral surface, there's this space between the legs, which is called the coxal gap. So based on this, you can tell how long a tick has been feeding, because what happens is there's something called the scutal index, which is the length of the tick uh, compared to the width, the scutum, which doesn't change. And then there's also something called the coxal index, which is the coxal gap, this gap between the legs, divided by the length of the tick. So in simple terms, the scutal index is the length of the tick. The coxal index is the width of the tick. <coughs> And that's basically what these two indices show. And what this shows is that with feeding, in the first 24 hours, the length of the tick doesn't really change, but the tick becomes more globular. So that's the coxal index that increases. But with increased feeding, the length of the tick becomes longer. And so the scutal index increases. So a tick that's been feeding a short time has an increased coxal index. A tick that's been feeding a longer time has an increased scutal index. And this is shown with a fluorescent study. Here again, early feeding, within 24 hours, the tick becomes more globular. But with it, you know, progressive feeding, on day six, you get this increased length of the ticks, and the scutal index becomes big. So using this, um, uh, Ellie Hino, Phyllis Mervine, and I set out to look at some patients in California who'd been bitten by ticks and appeared to be infected in a very short period of time. And we had three patients, uh, one who was bitten in Napa, California, one in Sonoma, California, and one in San Diego County, California. These were the locations of the tick bites, two on the neck, one on the chest. The um, estimated time of duration of tick attachment was less than 12 hours in two of these patients, and less than four hours in the third patient based on the amount of time that they had been exposed to ticks prior to finding the tick that was attached. Um, when these patients were tested for Lyme disease, uh, two of them had weekly positive IFAs, shown here. The third one didn't have an IFA done. All three patients had positive IgM, Western blots, suggesting that, again, this was early infection. None of them had positive IgG Western blots, suggesting it was later infection. Uh, the C57 natural killer cell level was normal, and the C4A test was, was showed a high level. I don't have time to go over what those mean, uh, but uh, that basically is consistent with early or acute infection. And then one of the patients was co-infected with B. duncani. Uh, the other two had no evidence of co-infections. Um, and again, I, I guess, I thought these had been taken out of the slides, but I guess they haven't. Um, the, the natural killers, the C57 natural killer cells and C4A testing, uh, are ways of showing whether this is early versus late Lyme disease. Uh, again, with uh, early Lyme disease, the CD57 level is normal, as shown in this study. Um, with C4A levels, early Lyme disease, the levels are increased, as shown by this study from uh, Richie Shoemaker. Uh, so this is what our patients had, suggesting that this was early infection. Um, 
Two other points about these patients. In all three cases, tick removal was difficult. Uh, in one case, the head of the tick was left in. Um, and in all three cases, the coxal index, so the width of the tick, as far as the investigators could see, was increased. But the scutal index, the length of the tick, did not seem to be enlarged. So again, this is evidence that attachment was less than 24 hours. So we published this article, and we got a response from Joe Peasman and Jeremy Gray saying that they weren't convinced that this was uh, transmission within that time frame. And we wrote a letter in response saying, yes, we thought it was. And the journal, interestingly, published both of these letters. And then they also published a third letter that they hadn't shown us that also um, uh, challenged the idea that this was uh, early Lyme disease transmission. And interestingly, when we complained that why didn't they let us respond to this letter, because this also had similar arguments uh, to the first one, the editor of the journal wrote back, our editors had received numerous communications about your article, all critical of our acceptance of the manuscript. This level of polarized debate was unique for our journal and my editor's experience that spans four decades. So welcome to the world of Lyme disease. So, um, but what was interesting about the letter from Peaceman and Gray was that they had this statement. From a public health perspective, the relationship between duration of tick attachment and risk of Lyme spirochete transmission should not be cast in absolute terms, searching for an absolute minimum time of attachment below which tick bite victims are totally protected. So again, based on that, they're admitting that rapid transmission within 24 hours could occur. Now, why else would they say this? Well, this was an older study by Peaceman's group uh, looking at uh, ticks, uh, at Borrelia and the salivary glands of feeding ticks. And what they found was that uh, at baseline, prior to feeding, there were 1.2 uh, Borrelia in the salivary glands. Uh, so basically, even before feeding, the Borrelia was there, ready to be transmitted. And again, this shows this in a more graphic form. Even before feeding, there was Borrelia there in the salivary glands, ready to be transmitted. It didn't take time for it to migrate there. It was already there. And a similar study showing that the hamster one hamster exposed for the minimum time interval of 24 hours became infected in this study. Again, rapid transmission in a hamster model, different from the other models that you saw. Uh, and this again shows the, you know, how long it takes to infect this hamster. Within 24 hours, there was some transmission, not a lot, but it happened. Now what about humans? There are actually very few studies of transmission in humans. And this is one of the problems with these statements that it doesn't occur in less than 48 hours. So this is a study from Europe showing that in 25 of 136 patients, 18% who were called a tick bite reported a tick attachment time of less than 24 hours. So based on history, it looks like rapid transmission occurred in this group. Uh, another study from uh, Dr. Sue here in this country, uh, four subjects developed Borrelia infection, one occurred in duration of attachment group less than 24 hours. And just to show you that, this was a woman who had an EM rash. Uh, interestingly, she did not seroconvert. Uh, she was bitten by a female adult tick, and the duration of attachment was estimated to be 14 hours. So again, evidence for rapid transmission in a human. And two other studies have reported the same thing. This is a study from a doctor in Bulgaria who went into tick, tick habitat and found that he had contracted Lyme disease within 24 hours of being in tick habitat. And then another study by Patmos and Remorca showing a case where disseminated Lyme disease occurred after only six hours of tick attachment. So again, all of these human studies support rapid transmission of Lyme disease. Now, what about other factors in this transmission? And I don't have much time to talk about this, but this is the famous ticks as sewers of infection slide because they have all these co-infections that can be transmitted along with the Lyme bacteria. And this is a study that you'll probably hear about later from Dr. Sperling, uh, showing that in Canada, the, the co-infection rate can be as high as 66%. So many of these ticks may be co-infected with other organisms that can affect transmission. And uh, this is a statement from Dr. Sinsky saying, although co-infections with Borrelia, Anaplasma, and or Babesia in ticks from Poland appear to be common, the potential influence of co-infections on transmission dynamics remains poorly understood. And that's kind of one of the unknown unknowns. So just in conclusion, Lyme disease transmission may occur within 24 hours of a tick bite. Transmission of Borrelia burgdorferi is dependent on spirochete tick and host factors. 
Transmission of Lyme disease to humans in the clinical setting may occur more rapidly than animal models suggest. And Lyme disease should not be ruled out based on a short tick attachment time in a symptomatic patient. And um, I think I'll stop there. Do I have another minute? <laughs> no, I think I'll stop there. But.